what many historians believe to be our second war of independence. And on September 13th of that year, an American attorney was taken to a British ship in Baltimore Harbor to arrange a prisoner exchange. And while he was aboard that ship, he watched a 25-hour shelling of Baltimore's Fort McHenry when some 1,500 cannonballs, shells, and mortars were fired on the fort. And overnight, he felt the fort would fall to the British. But the next morning, he didn't see a white flag of surrender. He saw a huge 32 foot by 40 foot American flag flying above the fort, indicating an American victory. That attorney was also an amateur poet. His name was Francis Scott Key, and he was inspired to write a poem called The Defense of Fort McHenry, the first stanza of which became our national anthem. Right over the 
the target. If you look towards the rear of the airplane, you'll see the streamers come out, and they will present what we call a vertical target. They are weighted on the bottom, so they don't float with the thermals that are rising from the heated air on the ground. Now, once they come out, the airplane will start on a slight bank turn, and all the members of the team will be looking out that rear door, making their mental calculation. All right, streamers are now in sight. The airplane's gonna complete that turn and go up to the target altitude for the opening of the American flag. Under the canopy, national anthem. Technical Sergeant Ainsley DeWitt, who did such a great job on the anthem yesterday, is backed by popular demand, I should say. My the demand. Sergeant, technical Sergeant will be singing the anthem again, alive and in person. It's interesting, Danny, as we see this, it, this, is, uh, this looks like a very mundane, unexciting, unimportant part, but it in fact is critical for the jumpers to get to the target. Now what I'm seeing, as opposed to yesterday and Friday, very little wind today, Rob. It is just, they are coming down just about straight down from where they drop. Now, the reason this is so important, the team knows about the winds at 3,000, 6,000, 9,000, 12,000. They know the winds on the ground from the sergeant who is relaying up information, wind velocity and direction. Sometimes way to the left and way to the right, you don't think they're coming back in, but they are the Golden Knights studying the winds, and they nail it. They nail that target. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to take you back in time. A few months short of 120 years ago. Use your imagination, look out on the runway. The airplane that you see in front of you, amongst all of the modern civilian Top Gun airplanes, airshow airplanes, this is where it all started. All the airplanes own their ancestry to the airplane in the air now. It is the replica of the Wright Brothers Wright B Flyer. The granddaddy of them all. Aviation as we know it today began here in Dayton with an airplane just like this one. Now the original version of the airplane almost 120 years ago was the result of the genius and innovation of two brothers who you know about, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They grew up, they lived, they worked right here in Dayton, Ohio in the early 1900s. Through their skillful application of science, Technology for a distance of 120 feet. Watch as the pilots of the modern replica of the Wright B flyer. Today they are pilot Jeff Stans and pilot Hank Griffin. They will demonstrate just what that first flight looked like. Let's go back in time. The year now 1911. This is where the original Wright B flyer would have been built. In the factory the Wright brothers constructed in West Dayton, the first aircraft manufacturing plant in the United States of America. This airplane would have been one of about 100 that they built and sold to the U.S. Army Signal Corps and the civilian market. Dayton, Ohio in 1911 was an amazing place. At that time, Dayton was the center of innovation and new technologies. For a better perspective on that, you can visit Corillion Park here in the city of Dayton. You will be amazed. Well, the flyer is airborne, as you can see. Remember, this airplane was built to look and fly like an original, so don't expect it to form the amazing maneuvers like the other great aircraft you'll see on display today. This airplane climbs only at about 200 feet per minute. Not very impressive. It will fly about 60 miles per hour. Not very fast. But remember, it was the first airplane in regular service with the U.S. military and it outperformed other aircraft available to the military at that time. They're at about 75 feet. They'll find the length of the air show lines for photo opportunities, and I urge you to get that in your cameras and your phone. Up and down the flight line two or three times, depending on their time, to show you what it looked like back in 1911. Well, the Wright B Flyer organization was formed in the mid-1970s to build, but mostly folks, to fly an airplane that looks and flies like the original in order to offer the Wright Brothers experience to current pilots and to keep the Wright Brothers dream of flight alive. The first airplane built by the Wright
ground from the front to the back, and it still works. And they also applied something to their right B flyer and later on uh, aircraft that just took them back to their bicycle days, right? Yes. Yes. The, the uh, engine turned the craft through and he crosses over. The jump master. Gives Man, watch close, because you are about to find out. The jumper is out and has ignited his smoke as he glides to his precise exit point. This is a perfectly good parachute and can be landed. However, the jumper will release one side of the parachute, intentionally causing it to malfunction. Don't be alarmed when you see his first parachute begin to streamer. There's absolutely no danger to the jumper. This is our only solo maneuver, yet one of our most exciting. The jumper is now accelerating to Earthward as speeds in excess of 90 miles per hour. So he must release it completely. Return to free fall. And deploy his main parachute. This is our solo. This is a perfectly good parachute. The reserve, or is the only parachute used by the Gold Knights, is a flexible wing glide, such as the one you see now. However, there are some differences. It is white color, with a slightly smaller wing surface area. It's a much greater forward air speed of up to 20 miles per hour. This enables the jumper to make it back into any tight situation, such as a downtown intersection or a major league stadium. While each jumper will repack his or her own main parachute. A certified parachute technician must repack the reserve every 180 days, whether it is used or not. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice that this jumper is flying a 1,200 square foot drop plane. That's larger than your average apartment in New York City. To orient such a large flag, a 35 pound weight is attached to the bottom. That plus the weight of the flag adds 50 pounds to the jumper. The release parachute you see floating earthworms will be recovered, untangled, and hooked up to be used again. If it does float towards you, please do not attempt to catch or retrieve it. Our parachute recovery team is on its way. At 1,000 feet, the jumper does a wind penetration check, checking his speed and distance across the ground. He then flies a downwind leg. A base leg 90 degrees to the target. Then faces into the wind for a final approach. These jumpers train year round, piling their parachutes, but they always seem to fly better when they can hear the roar of the crowd. Make some noise as his first jumper brings it into the target area. Watch the movements he makes with his hands. And a dead center landing. Unlike the military jet teams, the United States Army Parachute Team is comprised mostly of non-commissioned officers. The 89 men and women of the Golden Knights come from various jobs throughout the Army to spend three years in one of our five major sections. We have the mission of keeping these aircraft flying after more than 10 years of military experience. Together, their expertise results in the safest possible aircraft for the Golden Knights. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look overhead, it'll appear that two parachutes have become entangled. However, that is not the case. These jumpers are performing a facet of the sport known as canopy relative work. Thanks in part to the advanced aerodynamic design of these ram air parachutes, it is possible for one jumper to fly his parachute right into the hands of another jumper without adversely affecting its flight characteristics. The formation you see here is a side-by-side. -side. As they approach the target area, you may hear the command ready break as they separate just prior to their landing. Make some noise as these jumpers bring it into the target area. 
for stand up man. The F 15s.
on a shopping cart and that would preclude a successful takeoff. So that nose was kept high. They forced the airplane off with full flaps at a very slow speed. Now the airplane could fly. However, if an engine failed on either side or lost significant power, they had no rudder control. They would crash into the structure of the airplane or go over the side. So even the takeoff was precarious until they got the speed where both B-25, it had a greater speed and a dive than many of the fighters we had going into World War II. It was a medium range bomber. From the deck of the Hornet, those pilots knew they would very likely not have enough gas to get to their bases in China where they could refuel and then come home. And given an opportunity to scrub the mission, they still scrambled to the aircraft and got on their way. In about an hour and a half, all 16 planes were launched, and they flew a very tough five hours at about 50 feet above the water to evade detection by Japanese radar, and popped up when they reached the Japanese coast to five different cities' military targets. With only four bombs per aircraft, they bombed the targets of Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Yokohama, and then proceeded on to their bases in China. But running out of gas, Danny, some of them didn't make it, did they? Ran out of gas, some had to parachute, some perished, some went to prisoner of war. Some were expected by the Marine Corps, and they called it the PBJ. And it was used to interdict enemy shipping. They had massive 75 in the field without asking anybody. We just need more firepower. It was so successful when the aircraft came back to the factory to get overhauled. They did their top secret testing at Peel Field outside of Naval Air Station Pensacola. By the way, the movie was uh, reviewed by all of the living raiders and they said it was a pretty accurate depiction. It has both combat footage out of sea on the takeoff Tokyo. and then movie vintage, a uh, movie film as well. Some of the real thing and a little bit of Hollywood. Now there's another movie that came out much later based also on a book by Joseph Hillard called Catch-22. It's about B-25s in the Mediterranean were shot down in Guyana, Mexico. It included 17 B-25s that were able to fly and one that was struck in to be the wreckage airplane simulating a crash landing with the windshields crack and the gear up and wings damaged. That is a great motion picture with no computer generation images of the B-25. Catch-22, both the book and the movie. Frank Tolman, the legendary Hollywood stunt pilot, was the chief pilot of that motion picture. It is called a dark comedy. A lot of Hollywood stars were in that one. So I won. So 30 seconds over Tokyo, or Catch-22. Great movies about this aircraft.
up over the top, backwards to a backflip, a loop in the field 101. Oh god. Now Kirby pounds of cargo at these speeds with a nautical with a range of 2,400 nautical miles. Watch it as the C-17 comes through an airplane that is not a bit This C-17 is loaded to 515,000 pounds. This one has a stick. Technical pitch to land. Legendary Bob Hoover, the Raptors, Hoover Pitch. Got something very special for you. It's called the wolf. and they have some superb height. It was interesting, Danny, that until the F-16 was developed and from the Russians, the Germans in World War II. 
Now we'd like to tell you that his sponsor, Air Wisconsin, currently has a one streaming pad. Rick Myers, call sign Sarge, and his team of military veterans. As we see it go by, and we've seen it, we've seen it go by. Set up and do it again. We have a little radio chatter going on between uh, folks who had to be, who had to, our air boss uh, Kelly Hudson and uh, assistant air boss Jim Tucharone uh, had to do a little discussions with some things. Uh, what, 25 miles an hour, something like that. It is time to stand up, move forward, and get ready. The show is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the most feared aircraft in the world today, your United States Air Force's F-22 Raptor!
any combination of eight missiles and a 